Now, adults, I want to make a few uh, announcements before we have uh, Matt come. It's been a while since we've had baptism here at New Life, and I'm excited just to let you know that the Sunday following Easter, we are going to have a baptism service. So we'll have the tank out here, and we've got one person who wants to be baptized right now. And if you are curious about baptism and what that means, then I'd love it if you could follow up with me after the service, or you can send me an email, paul at newlifecollingwood.com. You can call the church office, leave a message on my phone, and say, hey, I'd like to know more. And uh, saying that you want to know more doesn't mean you're committing to anything. It's just uh, we can get together and talk about baptism and what that is. So that's the Sunday after Easter that we're going to celebrate that. Also, today is the beginning of Holy Week. And our denomination, the Be In Christ Church of Canada, has put together a fantastic resource for this week, for Holy Week. So if you go to our website, newlifecollingwood.com slash Easter you will find uh, a link that will take you to the digital version of the Holy Week uh, devotional. And it is uh, beautiful, beautiful artwork, photography, um, and writings. And each day of the week, it will prepare you for leading up to Easter. And I'd encourage you to do that. If you're not sure or you don't know quite how to do that, you can always um, call or email the church. We will print you off a copy if you're not sure how to access it online. We'd be happy to do that for you. Also, I want to let you know some of the things that we are able to do in ministry here. So we've been running support groups um, not long after the pandemic started. We had begun this before it began, but we've been just seeing a, a very beautiful, slow momentum happening and building in our youandmind.ca support groups. And that is for people with a lived experience of anxiety or depression or those that have someone in their life that has that lived experience. And uh, you can find out more information about that. Again, uh, go to the website or just go to youandmind.ca and you can find out more about that. And um, just want you to be aware of, of those. Um, so that's one of the things that we're able to support. Youth ministry, not only here at New Life, but we're able to support uh, Youth Unlimited or Youth for Christ and, um, and working in partnership with Young Life as well, locally. Uh, there are um, compassion needs that are going on. So throughout the pandemic, we've been able to um, meet different compassionate needs that people have as the pandemic has taken its toll on people. Uh, we've got a great staff team that, that kind of keep everything going here and uh, work with all of our volunteers. And we have this amazing facility. And it's your generosity that allows these things to take place. So we don't often talk about our offering. We don't pass the plate anymore. But when you're going out, if you'd like to, to do a, a paper donation, uh, there's a black box there that you can drop that in. Or you can go online. If you go to newlifecollingwood.com, there's a button there that says give, and it'll give you all the different ways that you can give electronically. And it's just a reminder for us of these are the things we're able to do, but it's because of your generosity. And so we wanted to say thank you for that. So... Um, I want to introduce our speaker for this morning. His name is Matt Vincent. He comes from the metropolis of Ancaster, Ontario. If you know where Ancaster is, it's near Burlington, Hamilton area. And uh, Matt has been a friend for quite a few years. And I think Matt grew up actually just down the road in Meaford, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, has been involved with Be in Christ at the denominational level, working with a lot of our church plants, a network of churches called Reunion. And uh, he's just a good friend, a solid guy, and I'm excited that he's here to share with us this morning. So Matt, I'm going to give it to you, and just thank you, brother, for coming. Yeah, man, thank you. Share. It's great to be here. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, you're right. So I, didn't, I grew up in Toronto, um, but then my parents pulled a fast one on me at the end of grade 10. Uh, kind of around May or June, they sat my brothers and I down. They said, well, we're moving to a town called Meaford. We'd never heard of Meaford. You know, when you grow up in Toronto, you don't really know some of the beautiful small towns. So then I finished high school in Meaford just down the, down the road here. So coming back, I came here last night and I just drove around a little bit. Lots of memories, although Collingwood's changed so much. It's unbelievable the changes here. But I do remember, like, my first date in high school was at, like, the movie theater here in Collingwood. So there's, like, all these memories that are coming back, and it was 30 years ago. So it's just great to be here and good to be with you in person, Paul, thanks for the invite. Uh, I've been hoping to come and join and hang out for a little while, but man, the last two years have just disappeared. But it's really good to be in person. I think this is the most people I've been in a church setting with for like quite some time. So 
Paul said the other day, oh, so many of our people are here, there, and everywhere. I'm not sure how many people will be around. And I said, well, this is still the most people I've been with in this capacity. And it's also good to see some old friends from my days uh, long ago at the meeting house, the McGuire. So it's nice. Yeah, it feels really good to be here. Okay, let me start with this. Um, how many ha- hockey fans do we have here? Any? More specifically, Toronto Maple Leafs fans. Do we have any Leaf fans? Okay, great game last night, by the way. It was awesome. Um, so I grew up, like I said, in Toronto, and I was been a Leaf fan my whole life. And when I was younger, obviously I wasn't allowed to stay up and watch the full game. So we'd start the game, and then I'd have to go to bed. And, but I had a little Walkman in my, in my bed that my parents, I don't think, knew about. Like, they've never admitted they knew about it, but I had it there, and I listened to every game. Uh, I think those days it was... 14.30, a.m. 14.30, I believe. And so I used to listen to it, loved it the whole time. And, uh, and this year I'm really excited about the Leafs because I think this is our year. And now my wife, Bobby, says every year I say that. Every single year I say I have a good feeling I think this is going to be our year. And she's like, there's no way. And so uh, I don't know what's going to happen. But I guess at some point in my life, I hope that the Leafs win the Stanley Cup. And they, you know, lift the cup. And there's this huge celebration. There's a big parade down Young Street. I just hope that at some point in my life I will see that. Maybe crazy, but I'm still holding out hope. Now, for those of you who aren't sports fans, forgive the kind of illustration, but I think it's fitting when we talk about Palm Sunday. As we join with the global church and enter Holy Week, there's this scene in the scripture that was already read for us and that we're going to read again together, where it's almost like there's this huge victory parade. And I think it's a good hook for us as you're using your imagination. It's this idea of this massive celebration that's happening just outside of Jerusalem as Jesus is entering the city. And so that's where I want to lead us today. And, um, and I'll explain. You're going to have a part to play too. So I'm going to share a few thoughts and ideas. Uh, but I view my role almost as facilitator. So you're going to have a part to play in just a few minutes. So some of you will be squirmy about that. I recognize it. But I'll... I'll make it as painless as possible for you. But here we go. Let's, if you have your Bibles, I think it's going to be up here as well. This is from Luke chapter 19. Uh, I know for some of you, whenever we enter, you know, the rhythms of the church calendar, Holy Week, these passages that we read feel so old and familiar. And sometimes what that can do to us is that we just miss things or we feel like there's nothing new about it. And I get that. You've probably read these passages hundreds of times. I don't know your story. Maybe there's people here too who are just you know, exploring the message and teachings of Jesus. You're brand new to this. Maybe this is like the first, second, or third time you've heard this. So wherever you are on that spectrum, hundreds of times you've listened to this, or maybe this is like under 10 for you, uh, I do really believe that there's something special when we read Scripture. Something special happens. And I know it's a weird thing to think about, but we believe that there's this, this moment that happens as we read Scripture, that as we're guided by the Holy Spirit present here, that God awakens us and helps us to pay attention to certain things. And so I believe that as we read this together and as we have this conversation, that God may want to say something important to us or remind us maybe, bring something to mind that we've forgotten about long ago. And so we want to pray, wherever you are on that spectrum, we, we pray that there's a sense of awareness of what God is saying to us as people as we gather and read Scripture. So here we go, Luke chapter 19, let's read this all the way through, and then uh, we'll, get, we'll get going into some other thoughts. Beginning uh, verse 28, after telling this story, Jesus went on toward Jerusalem, walking ahead of his disciples. As he came to the towns of Bethage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples ahead. Go into that village over there, he told them. As you enter it, you will see a young dog- donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, why are you untying that colt? Just say, the Lord needs it. So they went and found the colt, just as Jesus had said. And sure enough, as they were untying it, the owners asked them, why are you untying that colt? And the disciples simply replied, the Lord needs it. So they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it for him to ride on. As he rode along, the crowd spread out their garments on the road ahead of him. When he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. Blessings on the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. But some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, Teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. He replied, If they kept quiet, the stones along the road would burst into into cheers. But as he came closer to Jerusalem and saw the city ahead, he began to weep. 
How I wish today that all of you people would understand the way to peace. But now it's too late. The peace is hidden from your eyes. Before long, your enemies will build ramparts against your walls and encircle you and close you in from every side. They will crush you into the ground and your children will be uh, in your children with you. Your enemies will not leave a single stone in place because you did not recognize it when God visited you. So in some way or another, for the last like 20 plus years, I've had chances to speak to churches. So that doesn't mean I'm any good at it. It just means I keep getting opportunities. So apologize in advance, however this goes. But as I've been doing that, you know, everyone finds their own voice, their own rhythm, their own way of doing it. And then about a year ago, I kind of switched things up. Not that I wouldn't describe it as falling into a rut, but I felt like God kind of awakened me to a new way of reading scripture. It started in my own kind of personal time. A friend of mine kind of got me onto it. And it, it's, it's really helped me think and read scripture in a brand new way, in my own kind of reading and study, but also in conversations like this with church friends. And so this is the, the pattern I want to follow, and I'm going to invite you to follow with me today. It's think, wonder, do. And I'm going to explain that here in just a second. So first, think. It's really the idea of what do you think. This is normally what we do in churches. We use our intellectual side, our cognitive side. We think, so what does this mean? What do you think is the thing that we go? And we, we look at Scripture. We understand the historical context. We try to bring other uh, passages of Scripture around it to help us with our understanding. But it's really engaging our, our minds, our intellect, to think about the passage we're reading in. Great. We, we often do that. Then the next section, though, which is probably something we don't often do, is what do I wonder? So this is inviting you to ask those crazy questions. It's saying, it's okay for you to say, yeah, but what about? Like, why didn't they give us more information along this? Or they say that, but they don't tell us about that. Or, wait, what's going on? What's missing? So it just invites you to use what we call biblical imagination. It's this idea of saying, I read this, uh, the text, I'm doing my best to understand, but I'm trying to put myself now into it and just ask those wondering questions. It's not being afraid of those and thinking those that, those, uh, that those things are going to lead us astray. It's embracing those ideas and just asking those questions. Um, Susan Halen from Columbia Theological Seminary says this about that. Unless we employ our imaginations, we will never understand how the stories and letters, poems and visions of Scripture relate to our lives. In my own experience as a teacher of the New Testament, I find that the greater problem is not that we exercise uh, too much imagination in interpretation, but that too few people have a religious imagination that is grounded in Scripture. And so that's what we want to do. We want to wonder. And then the last thing is the, so what do I do? What do we do with that? It's the classic application at the end of every kind of talk or sermon or teaching. It's like, so what do we do with that? For those people who are saying yes and have committed to following Jesus, so what do we do with that? Something written so long ago, we try our best to understand, we try our best to put ourselves in, ask the questions, wonder, sit in the place of awe before God, but then what do we do with that? And so that's the form we're going to take, and that's what's uh, part of what you're going to do uh, in a few minutes as well. So first, the think. So what do I think? So I'm going to share some of the things that I think as I've been praying and thinking about this, knowing that you know, we're going to have this time together. First thing is this idea of we've all been waiting for this. So this is like the people in the passage we read. They have all been waiting for this. So it may seem like, you know, when you read it, it's not that big a deal. But in verse 1, it says, after Jesus had said this, which then begs the question, so what had he just said? So earlier in chapter 19, Jesus is hanging out with this guy named Zacchaeus, who is this hated tax collector. And as they're having this this time together, Jesus goes on to tell a story. This is what it says in Luke 19, verse 11. The crowd was listening to everything Jesus said, and because he was nearing Jerusalem, he told them a story, watch this, to correct the impression that the kingdom of God would begin right away. To correct the impression that the kingdom of God would begin right away. See, there was this growing sense of anticipation, of expectation, of energy, among the people that God was going to do something really significant, and they equated that to the establishment of the kingdom of God again, and that the Messiah would be coming, and that they would rule again. See, the ancient people at this point in the story are ruled by the Roman Empire. They're under Roman occupation, and all they wanted 
uh, was to get out from under that. They wanted their kingdom, the, the nation of Israel, to again be a place of prominence, of power, to have influence. And they just wanted and expected that the king was coming. And so Jesus is telling that story earlier. He's telling the story to help correct their impression of what was going on. Because even though there's this groundswell of energy, Jesus knows that there's something more that's going on. So they've all been waiting for this. Because they think, and what's happening, ha- happening here, is that this new king and kingdom is going to be established through the Messiah. That's what they're thinking right there. Then I ask, and I think, what's with the donkey? I don't know if you think about that. But it seems like a, kind of a re- an interesting thing, right? What, what's with the donkey there? So, uh, in many of the gospel stories, as you know, my impression of who I think Jesus is, he seems like a fairly relaxed person. He's open to interruption. When people just kind of come into whatever he's doing, he, he most often will stop what he's doing and pay attention. Uh, he seems like he's not trying to control the environment or the setting. He seems like a pretty laid-back guy. But this is an instance that gets my attention, makes me think about it, makes me stop, because it seems like this is one instance where Jesus is, is orchestrate might be too strong a word, but kind of bringing things and putting them in the proper place and order because he knows something else is happening. So he's help, helping to set this up. And we see that. We just read that, right? He is instructing a few of his friends to go to these towns to find this donkey, what to say to the owners when they're going to ask. And sure enough, that happens. I don't know if you're like a movie fan or whatever, but I grew up watching Star Wars. And there's a scene in Star Wars where like Obi-Wan and Luke um, and the two droids are trying to avoid detection from the Empire. I don't know if this rings a bell for anyone. It's hard to tell with masks and stuff if people are, with, like, understanding. Uh, but they, they use this line, like, these are not the droids you've been looking for, right, to the stormtroopers. These are not the droids you've been looking for. And then they're able to go on their way. And in my mind, I, I don't know what's going on, but it's like when the owners of the donkey are saying, like, what do you need this for? And they're like, well, the Lord needs it. It's almost like, well, the Lord needs it. That, that's how it strikes me. And then they're like, oh, okay, you can, you can take it. But still I'm wondering, but, but what, what's with the donkey? Well, check this, 500 years, about 500 years before that, there's a prophet, and his name's um, Zechariah, and this is what he writes, because he talks about the coming Messiah. And so this would have been in the minds of the people. In Zechariah chapter 9, it says this, Rejoice, O people of Zion, shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's Cold. So when Jesus goes for this donkey, the owners let his friends take it and bring it to Jesus, and he gets on this donkey. This is all the things that are queuing for the people. Remember, they've been waiting for this. Now Jesus is on this donkey, and he's approaching Jerusalem. The third thing I think about is this picture of a victory parade. I use the story of the Leafs, our hope for the Leafs, uh, in the beginning. But let's talk about this victory parade, but then also talk about how it's not what it really is looked like. It's a, you know, victory parade, but not so fast. So on the victory parade, uh, you can imagine it would have been quite a scene. People are um, singing and dancing and yelling and shouting out and laying down their clothes, and it tells us in other gospel accounts that they're cutting off palm branches and laying them down on the road. They're almost like resurfacing the path towards the city. Uh, A number of years ago, uh, my family and I, we love to go to the fall fair in Ancaster, um, we hope it's back this year. It's been off for a couple years. But the last time we were there, it's always at the end of September. And it was quite a cold fall night. Like, it's like, you know when summer's ending and you get those evenings and it's like, oh, it's actually pretty cold tonight. But we were there and it was a beautiful, clear night. And we love going, like, to the demolition derby part. I don't know if you know that. Like, we just love that. It's so fun. And um, at the Ancaster Fairgrounds, it's, like, sloped down. So you're sitting on the grassy slope, and these cars are, like, demolishing each other. And our favorite event is what's called, I think it's the figure eight. Has anyone, do you guys know what that is? Like, that's a whole different level of madness. So they have to do a certain number of laps in a figure eight. And so every time they're crossing in the middle, like, you're just waiting for mayhem to happen. It's amazing. So we're sitting there, and um, right in front of us are this young couple that clearly are on what I would say is probably their first date. They look like they're 16, 17 years old, and they're sitting close but not too close, and they're, you know, there's pauses in their conversation, and they're, you can tell they're really trying to, like, you know, get over their nerves, and it's like it's, they're right in front of us. I'm not trying to listen, 
but they're literally in front of me. So, so you kind of listen, right? And, you know, been married like 22 years, kids with me. I'm like, ah, this is kind of fun just to see this love, young love happening in front of you. So, and remember, it's a cold night. So at some point in this like smash up derby night, the girl makes some kind of comment about how cold it is. And the guy says, well, I'm not very cold. I'm like, what are you thinking? It's freezing here. But he offers her his coat, and he gives her his, her coat, and she takes it. And he's like, don't worry, it's not cold at all. And, like, we're all bundled up. We're sitting on blankets, wrapping them around us. So I, I don't know what's going on. But he's like, it's this act of chivalry. So when I read this account of people taking off their clothes and laying them down, to me, it, this is not a scene of just, like, some ancient chivalry. That's not what this is. Although it's kind of like that, but this is about giving honor and respect of deference, of recognizing the importance of what's happening. By them taking off their clothes, it's almost like they're submitting to what is happening right in front of them. It's more than just, oh, you look a little cold, or that road looks a little dirty. There's something greater that's happening here where they're recognizing Jesus as king. And it tips back, again, tips back to something that would have been in their consciousness, the stories of their people from a long time ago. So in in 2 Kings chapter 9... There's this interesting story where Elisha, the prophet, sends out another prophet to anoint the next king of Israel. So he sends the prophet, and they're supposed to find this guy named Jehu, who's this military, like, uh, captain. Amazing military guy. So Jehu, this military guy, is hanging out with his friends when this prophet messenger comes. And the prophet says, hey, I need to speak with you. So they go off on their own, and they have this conversation, and the prophet says, you are to be the next king. And so he anoints him with oil, and there's like this little ceremony, and then the prophet goes. So Jehu, Jehu comes back to his friends who are just like chilling, hanging out. And they're like, so what was that all about? And he's like, oh, don't worry, that guy is just kind of babbles. He goes on and on. You know, he's kind of strange prophet, like weird kind of things he's going to say. And they're like, no, no, no. They keep pressing him on it. And finally, he says this in uh, 2 Kings 9, verse 12. So Jehu told them, meaning he's telling his friends, He said this to me. This is what the Lord says. I have anointed you to be king over Israel. Then they quickly spread out their cloaks on the bare steps and blew the ram's horn, shouting, Jehu is king. And so when they're taking off their cloaks, there's this um, sign of respect, of honor, of humility, of submission, that this person who they think is going to become the king, and their version of the king is one thing, and Jesus knows it's something else, but they begin to lay down their clothes and welcome him, announcing him to be the king. So now the part where it's like, and not so fast. And not so fast. There's something that's going on for Jesus that, that I know he's kind of caught in turmoil. So we'll get to this in the imagination part in a, section, in a second, but Jesus is coming in, And it says when he kind of comes into the place and Jerusalem is within eyesight, he begins to weep. So I don't know if the cheering is still happening and he's kind of crying or if he's kind of left that behind a little bit as he's been heading towards Jerusalem. But at some point his heart is breaking as he sees the city because he knows there's something more out ahead of them. Have you ever been in a place where people are all happy and celebrating around you? but maybe something's going on in your own life or you know a little bit more about a story that people don't know or there's something that's not public knowledge that you're holding and keeping. You're kind of hanging on to that. And so while everyone around you is happy and celebrating and partying, you're kind of mixed and torn because you know something else is up. <clears throat> that to me is, I think, grabs what probably is going on for Jesus. He's clearly in the moment with people, and yet when he sees Jerusalem, the bigger picture, he, he remembers the bigger picture, and he begins to weep. Uh, not to spend, like, too much time on it, but we do know that it was kind of a foreshadowing of an attack that would be coming on the city of Jerusalem a number of years later, where they would be laid siege, and the, the whole place would be destroyed. But as Jesus is coming, he begins to weep because they had failed to recognize God in their midst and embrace the way of peace. So those are a few, three, three things that stick out to me when I'm thinking about this passage and trying to understand it in its broader context. Okay, a few of the wonder things. This is my favorite new way of approaching and asking God what's going on. 
They all don't necessarily have anything <clears throat> deep to teach us, but I think it's good to give ourselves permission to ask the questions and not be afraid of that. The first thing I think about are the owners of the donkey. I want, I'm not trying to go back to the donkey and hang out there too much, but I kind of wonder what's going on with them. So there's a part of me that wonders, was this a prearranged setup? Like had Jesus in some other manner let them know, hey, I'm going to be needing this. Are you guys cool with it? Yeah, we're good. Okay, I'm going to send two friends. How will we know if they're your friends? Don't worry, I'm going to give them a secret password. What's the password going to be? The Lord is going to need it. Okay, so as soon as two people we don't know show up and they ask for the donkey and the Lord needs it, we'll let it go. I don't know. Was it prearranged? Or maybe, I wonder, was there something about that moment that they're also picking up on that as soon as these people ask for this donkey, and say the Lord is in need of it, that there's something that just kind of warms in their heart, and they're like, I don't know why, but I think we're supposed to let them take it, and off they go. I, I, I don't know really what that's like. I also wonder for the owners, like, you know when you rent a car, you, you have to say, are you going to return the car to the same place you got it? So, like, did they follow along to get their donkey back? Were they part of the crowd? Was there an arrangement like, you better bring that back because we're going to need it later? Uh, it's not an insignificant gift to pass on a, uh, you know, a living animal that you would then use. So they, I would imagine they wanted that back. But something's happening in them and their willingness to say yes to what God is doing in that moment and participate with it. I think that's pretty cool to think about. And then I want to jump back to the Jesus part too. Like how difficult do you think this moment was for Jesus? I wonder about that. Like I wonder as he's going along and people are celebrating, like is he giving high fives? Is he like fist bumping people? Is he waving? Is he like eating it up? Because we know Jesus is fully human and fully God. So the human part of you, you got to think like as all these people are cheering and he knows like there's a celebration happening, what's going on internally for Jesus? Because we know he was in turmoil. Like he's present in the moment of celebration, but also recognizing what is out in front of him. And I can imagine the internal tension and turmoil that's going on for Jesus that there must have been a struggle there. And on a human level, I just wonder, man, what would, what would that have been like for him? What, what on earth would that have been like to carry that weight while everyone around him is like all happy clappy? Third thing I wonder about is why does it seem like the religious leaders always miss the point? This always feels like that as you read the gospel stories of Jesus. Not always, but most often. And I know there are fighting for their own power, their position. Jesus was a threat to them. There's all these things going on. But this is another time where I'm like, man, why do they always seem to miss the point? And then I wonder, are there a few there who are part of this that maybe think, wait a second, I remember those old stories from time gone by. Wait, he's riding on a donkey right now? Wait, people are laying down their stuff? Maybe God is actually doing something here. I wonder if all the Pharisees were united against Jesus or maybe some were stepping back and willing to say, wait, maybe something's really going on here. I wonder about that. I wonder what that would have been like for them as these religious leaders trying to maintain their status and power within the culture and the society. Okay, I'm going to pause there. Here's what we're going to do. We have a few minutes left before... Paul gives me the yank. So here's what we're going to do. I would like you to just take a moment, um, a couple minutes actually, to ask yourselves and the people around you, if you're just with a couple people, you can just turn to the person beside you, or if you want to circle up and have a little bit of a larger conversation, that's fine. Just ask yourself and the people with you, so what do you think and what do you wonder? You can just do those two. Or you can do, what does this mean? What do I do with this, if you want? But how about just the think and wonder? So what stands out to you? What jumps out to you? What grabs your attention? Or if you're not really sure what to do with that, just say, well, what do you wonder? What do you wish you had more information about? Or what do you, what do you kind of think like, hey, I wonder what that must have been like? Just talk about those things. I'm going to give you four minutes, and then I'm going to call you back together. So I don't know if Tech Man wants to slide up some background music, but just take a minute. If you're uncomfortable, I should also say this. I always say this to people. If you're uncomfortable having conversations or you're just here on your own, that's totally fine. The universal sign of I don't want to talk about it is just get out your phone. <laughs> and, then, and then we'll know. Like The people who have their phone coming out of their pocket right now, they're off limits. Just leave them alone. Give them some space. All right, take four minutes and I'll call you back together. Go for it.
Okay, let's, uh, let's just cut you off there. Um, it's no good way to do that, so thank you for... <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I want to share something, but just for the sake of hearing, I would love to, if anyone's willing, to, just to shout out something you were thinking or maybe something that someone else who you're talking to shared. You can share it on their behalf. But, like, what was jumping out to you? What did you think and what did you wonder? How big was the crowd getting Yeah. Yeah. That's great, Martha. How big was the crowd? Is it gaining momentum or more people joining? As it, that, yeah, that's great. I wonder. And that's the beauty about the wonder questions is you don't have to answer them. We just acknowledge like, yeah, I wonder what that was like. Because it doesn't tell us. What else? What do you wonder? What do you think? What were the Pharisees feeling? What were the Pharisees feeling at the time? Yeah. That's good. Why did it have to be an unwritten written cult? That's really good. Can I give you a little hint on that, a thought on that? Thinking is if it's never been used, never been written, that it's okay and then uh, available then for sacred purposes. It hasn't been used. So it's available for like a sacred act of worship. That's the thinking on that. But I wonder. Yeah. Yes. Did all those people still follow Jesus after? What happened to all those, that throng of people, this huge crowd? Yeah, it's great. What else? There's no wrong answer on the wonder. You might say, I wonder how much longer this is going to go. <laughs> yes, I've thought that too. How did they not know that Jesus was crying? So if all this is happening, and then they see, Jesus sees Jerusalem in the distance as they're approaching, and then he starts to weep. It's not like, it does not say a small tear grew in the corner of his eye. He's weeping. So I think we could, I mean, if I'm using my sense of imagination, I imagine people, some people did notice that. And then what was going on for them? They're like, wait a second, we're having this major party here. But the guy who's like, we're cheering on, like, is he crying? He's actually crying. What's going on? Which I guess for them, as they would follow the week through, if they happened to be around the city a week later when Jesus was arrested, crucified, put in the tomb, they were probably like, oh, like there's more going on here. Let's just leave it there. The thing about the wonder questions, and it happens every time I do this, is more people want to talk about the wonder. I think it just, um, it encourages us in our humanity just to be honest about when we're reading something and then we just don't know or we wish we knew some more. And it's inviting our imaginations to link up with our cognitive function to say, like, I think and I know and I, I believe these things, but I also wonder and feel and sense God kind of stirring this question in me, and those are all good things for us because God's created us in both those ways. Let me just read this quote. Uh, Daryl Bach in his commentary, he says this, Jesus' entry is a major statement about God's plan and the nature of his kingship. It is a message some rejoice in, others do not understand, and still others emphatically reject. So in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus is with his friends, and uh, this is what he asks them. He says, when Jesus uh, came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do the people say the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. And the question I want to leave you with is who do you then say Jesus is, because that's what we're confronted. Whenever we're talking and exploring the message, the person, the teachings of Jesus, at the end of it, to some degree, we always have to say, so what do I do with this? And this is a perfect instance to say, so who do you say Jesus is? Because in the crowd, we see all kinds of people. We see the closest friends who had already indicated that they believe Jesus to be the Messiah, the one they were waiting for. Their perception of probably what the, the kingdom would look like is going to be much different in a few weeks' time for them as Jesus is 
uh, crucified and put in the tomb and then raises again and they are empowered to lead the local church. So their whole thinking is going to be shifted in the next number of days. But in the moment, they recognize Jesus as Messiah. There's other people who are jo- probably just joining in the party, getting caught up in it all, maybe not even thinking about who Jesus is, but they're just kind of along for it, indifferent maybe, not really caring, not committed, just part of it, part of the party. And then there's others who stand a, a few steps back and they are rejecting it. They're not about it. They want to ignore what Jesus is, what they've seen. You know, when it says the friends are announcing and they're shouting out the miracles that Jesus had done as he's riding along, they're just ignoring all those things. They're not, they don't want to acknowledge the significance and who, a significance of what has happened and who Jesus says he is. And so I just want to leave you with, well, who do you then say Jesus is? Because it's a personal thing for you to think about and to wonder about and to question. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a moment just to be still And ask yourself the question, who do I think Jesus is? Who do I say he is? And then say, Jesus, what does that mean? And then we'll each have our own sense of what God is saying. So just take a moment. We're just going to be still. And then I'll close in prayer. Let's pray. Jesus, thanks that you are present here by your Holy Spirit. Believe that as we read scripture that you want to speak to us and lead us. And so thanks for doing that in small or significant ways. Just pray for friends here. Not sure where they're at, how they're feeling as we enter this holy week. We recognize that it has been a crazy time. There's been so many ups and downs through this last season. And it's sometimes hard to just stop and be present in the moment. And so at least for now, we just say, Jesus, we want to be as present as possible this coming week to kind of take the steps um, and the time that's needed for us to reflect well on the significance of this next week. And today we join the global church recognizing and celebrating Palm Sunday, this entrance of Jesus as king into the city of Jerusalem. And in the story, we see celebration and shouts of joy and laughter and we also Jesus recognize that you were in turmoil and were weeping for what was ahead of you and so we kind of hold those things in tension so for those who are seeking Jesus reveal yourself to them for those who are questioning be present with them in their questions and God continue to encourage us forward as we ask the question who who do we think you are who do we say you are Jesus reveal yourself Lead us in the coming week. Thank you for your willingness to face the city and to walk forward. Jesus, this is a time of worship and a week where we remember and wait with you. Amen. Matt, thank you for sharing with us this morning. Uh, I think that entry was a wonderful act of compassion for those that are searching for God in the moment. And I think it was a challenge for those whose religiosity was keeping people from having uh, that access to God. And I wonder how much the crowd influences the individual and how much it's okay to be influenced by the crowd in what God is doing. So I figured I'd share, I'm the pastor, so I can share my, my I wonder at the end. <laughs> Matt, thank you so much for helping us just to um, to to live in that story this morning. And I pray that it will sit with you this week. And uh, just a reminder that Friday is our Good Friday service here, 10 a.m., and it's the area Collingwood churches. So, and I want to emphasize that this morning that if you're here and you're like, I'm not sure about the amount of people, if you're wanting to come on Friday, you just need to be aware that the room will be significantly more full um, with some area churches coming. But it will be a a good Sunday, and all the same things will apply as we're doing here on Sunday. If you want to wear a mask, you wear a mask. If you don't want to wear a mask, don't wear a mask. Be mindful of your self-screening and how you're feeling when you're coming in public and, uh, and people's space. 
So thank you for being here today, and uh, do mingle, visit. I'm sure, Matt, um, if people want to chat, would, would love to connect with you. Connect with somebody new here today that you see and have some conversations, um, and enjoy the week. We'll see you here Friday or next Sunday, Lord willing. Um, Jesus is Lord. Amen. Hosanna. All right.